everyone, and welcome to our fourth parent and caregiver education webinar, IDEA versus Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. My name is Gretchen Knob, and I'm the Regional Director of the Epilepsy Association of Western and Central Pennsylvania, working out of our Camp Hill office. I would like to thank our generous sponsors for this webinar series, Greenwich Biosciences, Levanova, Zogenics, Norellis, Equestive Therapeutics, and UCB. I would now like to introduce our speakers for this evening. First, Ronnie Russell has served for over 23 years as an educational consultant with the Pennsylvania Training and Technical Assistance Network in Harrisburg, a division of the Pennsylvania Department of Education Bureau of Special Education. Her work includes regional coordination of special education, cyclical monitoring in correctional facilities, intensive interagency co coordination with child serving agencies, secondary transition indicator 13, and Medicaid billing in schools. Additionally, she provides technical assistance to a number of schools with procedural safeguards, IDEA chapter 14 regulations, autism, inclusive practices, and 504 Chapter 15. She received a master's in education from Shippensburg University and has a teaching certification in K through 12 in special education. And our next speaker is Nicole uh, Kopko. She has been an educational consultant with the Pennsylvania Training and Technical Assistance Network in Harrisburg since April of 2014. Nicole has 24 years of special education experience in public education. Immediately before coming to Patan, Nicole served as a director of special education. Nicole's uh, credentials include um, Pennsylvania certifications in elementary education, special education, reading specialist certification, special education supervisor certification, and she recently complete, completed her superintendent letter of eligibility requirements in December of 2020. At Patan, Nicole serves at, on three statewide initiatives, literacy, special education leadership, and special education law. She also supports IU's 8, 10, and 11 as the uh, Patan point of contact, POC, uh, POC. On a personal note, Nicole enjoys spending quality time with her family, including her wonderful eight-year-old granddaughter, Gwendolyn. And I am now going to turn the presentation over to uh, Ronnie. So Ronnie, if you want to go ahead and uh, get started, I'll turn that to you. Okay. Are you all right, Ben? Did you finish eating? Okay, can you put your food away? Okay, if everyone can mute, um, please. Thank you. So welcome, um, and thank you so much, Gretchen, for that wonderful uh, welcoming of me and Nicole. Um, as um, you know, we are here to talk about IDEA versus 504. Um, so hopefully um, that's what you're here to listen to this evening. And again, thank you for being with us this evening. Um, if you've never attended a patent um, training before, um, this just shows you the mission of the Pennsylvania Training and Technical Assistance Network patent is to support the efforts and initiatives of the Bureau of Special Education and to build the capacity of local educational agencies to serve students who receive special education services. So that's our background. So this is just PDE's Department of Education's commitment to the least restrictive environment, LRE. Our goal is for each child to ensure that their IEP uh, that their teams begin with the general education setting with the use of supplementary aids and services um, first before considering a more restrictive environment in special education. And just a disclaimer um, that Nicole and I always go over is the content of this professional development is not a substitute for legal counsel. Um, you may hear some opinions this evening or, or things being um, talked about. Again, um, it is not a substitute for legal counsel, so please don't take it as such. Just some objectives um, that we'll go over uh, with our time with you this evening. Uh, just to gain an understanding of the federal and state regulations related to IDEA in Section 504, 
Um, we'll also deter, um, excuse me, de define the term disability as it relates to Section 504. Uh, and then we'll identify the anti-discrimination protections for all students eligible for 504. And then we'll identify the components of service agreements and the types of services and accommodations available. And then most importantly, we'll identify resources related to Section 504, Chapter 15, IDEA, and Chapter 14. So let's start by going over the legal history and background. And again, this is one of the favorite parts of, of me and Nicole. Um, a lot of folks don't talk, like to talk about the legal basis of things, but um, this is where we live in our daily work. Um, so it is a, a passion of ours. So you see on the screen, um, we have the federal statute, which is IDEA 2004. That's our federal regulations that govern special education. Uh, and then those same regulations were revised with the IDEA 2006 regulations. And from that, our uh, Pennsylvania state special education regulations are chapter 14 that governs what regular public schools must do for special education students with special education. And then chapter 711 covers cyber and charter schools. And again, um, the, the interesting part about knowing our state regulations is oftentimes they are a greater protection than even the federal regulations that we must follow. So for today, we're not going to talk about those in depth, but we are going to talk about what you see there in red, which is the Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA, and Section 504 of the Rehab Act of 1973, and then our state, Chapter 15, is what you also will hear um, us talk about. So this uh, diagram here uh, basically just shows you um, what falls under each one. So when you look at IDEA is the federal regulation, the arrow under that is our state regulations, chapter 14 and chapter 711. And then the federal 504, and then chapter 15 is our state regulations for um, Section 504, and we're going to talk more in depth about that. This visual um, just shows you again how these three laws relate. So you see on the outer circle, the Americans with Disabilities Act and how it has a community focus, um, covers public buildings, telecommunications, public transportation, businesses. And then the circle in between that is the one we're going to talk about tonight, which is a greater protection, which is covering employees, facilities, parents, other individuals, um, students, of course, uh, extracurricular activities, and that's where the school focus comes in. And then in the middle, you see even more protections, which is our students that um, have a need for special education, which falls under IDEA, and, and the primary of, uh, focus of that is the student focus. So again, just another visual way of looking at these different regulations. So looking at this diagram, <clears throat> you see that um, the eligibility for Section 504. Um, so if I do not need specially designed instruction and I do not have a disability, I'm more than likely going to be in regular education and not have um, those specially designed instruction um, services. Now, if I have a disability and I don't need specially designed instruction, I might be eligible for a Section 504 plan or Chapter 15 plan, which we're going to talk about more this evening. Um, further, oh, sorry, go back one moment. Oh, thanks, Nicole. So further, um, if I don't have a disability, but I do need specially designed instruction, I might not um, need a 504 plan, but I might need ELL support or um, the multi-tiered systems of supports. And um, again, what we're not going to focus so much on tonight is special education, but um, if I have a disability and need specially designed instruction, then I probably would be eligible for an IEP. And as you see there, that falls under IDEA in chapter 14. Okay. Um, I believe this was given to you as a resource. <clears throat> and this is just another way, and I'm not going to read all over all of this for you, but just another way of looking at IDEA and 504 and how someone becomes eligible under each one of those criteria. Again, starting with the student in need at the very top 
and then going through the left side looking at the consideration for IDEA or special education and the right side of the screen there look or the chart looking at the consideration of a 504 plan and again these both fall under um, you know, the legalities of a free appropriate public education, but Nicole and I are going to talk a little bit further about that, but you do have this, I believe, as a resource um, to, to look at. Just another comparison of IDEA versus 504 regulations. Um, they both are federal law, so that is helpful to know, um, and chapter 14 and 15, so 14 special education state law, chapter 15 is the 504 state law, and we must follow both of those, um, but again, remembering that state law does supersede federal law, uh, because oftentimes it is a greater protection for our students. Um, one of the main differences here between 504 and Chapter 15, so the federal and the state, is that Chapter 15, our state regulations for 504, require parent permission and involvement, uh, whereas the federal 504 does not. And also, um, our state regulations around Chapter 15 require a written service agreement. Uh, and 504, the federal requirement does not. Again, Nicole is going to talk to you um, further about this um, later on in the presentation. So let's talk a little bit more about the legal history. So going way back, um, and I actually am a kiddo that was born in 1973, so we're talking 47 years ago, almost 48, where the 1973 Rehabilitation Act was passed. And basically what that said was that no otherwise qualified individual with a disability shall solely by reason of his or her disability be excluded from the participation in or be denied the benefits or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. We now refer to this as Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. And again, the, the big note here is that very last sentence um, that I read there too, is that the regulations do apply to all programs that receive federal funds. So uh, when you're thinking about, um, you know, do private schools have to follow this? Well, if they receive federal funds, yes, they do. Um, so just something to think about. So Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, uh, it is a civil rights law that prohibits discrimination. You're going to hear us talk a lot about that. It does focus on equal opportunity, equal access, and equal treatment. In other words, it is illegal for schools to discriminate on the basis of a disability by providing an opportunity to participate or benefit that is unequal to that provided to others, um, or that's not as effective as it is to uh, provided to others, um, or, or lowering the, um, uh, the quality of benefits, services, or programs that are provided to others. Um, it's illegal for schools to use policies and practices that intentionally or not result in discrimination. Um, to this end, schools must make accommodations and modifications to address those needs uh, of students with disabilities. Um, and so, um, like I say, this law applies to public elementary and secondary schools, among other entities such as charter schools. Again, some more legal history. So we had the disability civil rights law. Uh, passed by Congress in 1973, and then you see there the special education law, IDEA, passed in 1975. Those regulations then went into effect in 1977, and then the Office for Civil Rights, or otherwise known as OCR, um, in the U.S. Department of Education monitored compliance with Section 504, so it's been around quite some time. Um, it was the precursor to the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990, and then the ADA did um, add some amendments to their act in 2008. And then also um, Pennsylvania has added or, or has their chapter 15 regulations. Um, the amendments that the ADA made in 2008 were things such as broadening the definition of a disability, um, expanding what's a major life activity. And we are going to go through um, what some of those are. 
Um, they did include major bodily functions and episodic um, remission um, conditions, and we'll talk about those. Um, they also lowered the standard for substantial limitation, and they also uh, included a mitigating measures rule um, such that um, you cannot consider the ameliorating effects of measures um, such as medication or mobility devices when determining eligibility of a student with a disability. And we will talk about that a little bit more. So one of the biggest things to remember here about uh, Section 504 and Chapter 15 is that it leveled the playing field. Um, it, it recognized that um, you need to have equal treatment and services, um, um, but also they may not be sufficient to convey equal benefit. Um, however, for non-discrimination to occur, the school must provide services that level the playing field. And hopefully um, that's not a new term for you. Um, and, and you've probably been hearing about that a lot now. Um, so we want to make sure that the Section 504 um, emphasizes that eligible students have equal participation and opportunity for benefit. Um, so again, remembering that for AIDS, our, our benefits or services provided to be equally effective, they are not required to produce this, the identical result or level of achievement for handicapped or non-handicapped persons, but must give students with disabilities an equal opportunity to re, um, obtain the same results, um, gain the same benefit, or reach the same level of achievement um, as their peers. Um, and it is to be done in the most integrated setting appropriate to the person's needs. Again, going back to um, at the very beginning of, of talking to you this evening, talking about the least restrictive environment. Um, and so really overarching, just remembering that Section 504 really does level the playing field. So then more legal history. So where did our state regulations um, out of this come, um, Chapter 15, the Protected Handicapped Students? Um, it does address Pennsylvania's um, local education agency's responsibility to comply with the requirements of Section 504. Um, it does protect um, students with a, ha um, a qualifying handicap who have a physical, mental, or health impairment from discrimination because of those impairments. So it really is a great protection. Uh, and similar to comparing um, the federal IDEA and Chapter 14 state regulations, schools must comply uh, with Section 504 and Chapter 15. Um, this is not something that we actually uh, monitor uh, right now um, at our level. However, um, if a school does not comply with this, um, the Office of Civil Rights would be notified and they would make a visit to the school. So something that we, we don't want to see happen in our schools. So. Uh, it does focus on equal opportunities and equal treatment. You've heard me say that. And it is an anti-discrimination law. Um, again, a child student should not be excluded from participation from some activity or be treated differently due to his or her disability. Um, so please just keep that in mind. And unfortunately, um, the reason that, you know, we talk about this a lot is because school districts, um, not all, of course, but some have broken this rule um, and excluded students from participation in an activity or allowed a student to be treated differently due to their disability. So we really want to make sure that that is not happening and that everyone's treated equally. So what are the eligibility criteria and definitions when it comes to a 504 or Chapter 15 service agreement? A student must be determined to one, have a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activity, so only one, they should have a record of such impairment or be regarded as having such an impairment. So any student that qualifies for any of these three prongs meets the definition of having a disability and receiving the non-discriminatory protections under Section 504. Now again, keep in mind, that does not mean that they would have a uh, Chapter 15 service agreement, but they do have those non-discriminatory protections um, so we do need to keep that in mind. And so what we mean by having a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activity, um, it's, for example, a student who has cancer and is going through chemotherapy. Um, they may need continuous breaks in the nurse's office throughout the school day in order to stay focused in class 
um, as long as possible. Um, and again, we'll talk about this a little bit further, but a student, when we say having a record of such an impairment, what we mean by that is a student who no longer meets eligibility criteria for a special program for students with disabilities. So a student that maybe was in special education um, is an example of someone who has a record of having a disability. Denying that student uh, the opportunity to participate in field trips because of a previous history of a disability um, is an example of a discrimination under Section 504. Another example would be if a student was blind um, through some medical marvel, the child's blindness is cured. They would have a record of such an impairment and therefore by the letter of the law would still be eligible. And again, we'll talk about some more of these as we go on. Um, and just noting that uh, 504, just like special education, is a two-pronged criteria. All students uh, who have a disability or have a record of a disability or are regarded as having a disability are protected from discrimination under Section 504. And some of those students under the second prong would qualify under the first definition requiring a Section 504 service agreement in order to have equal access in their education in the least restrictive environment. So again, as you see here, remember it's only the definition that ensures students the right to a 504 service agreement, which entitles the student to a free appropriate public education. Um, and, and just keeping note that um, the requirements of that free appropriate public education or FAPE as you otherwise um, hear that called under section 504 are more limited and require additional analysis. Um, in comparison <clears throat> to other students, and we're going to go over those more in depth. So it is much broader than IDEA, the, the special education federal regulations. Um, it basically, this the definition of a physical or mental impairment under 504 looks at any physiological disorder or condition uh, be it cosmetic disfigurement, anatomical loss affecting one or more of the following body systems. And again, I won't read all of those to you, uh, but it could be a skin condition. It could be digestive. Um, it could be reproductive, endocrine, any of those you see there. And so for the purpose of IDEA, the LEA needs to look at the child in relationship to one of our 13 disability categories. Whereas with 504, it's much broader um, array of conditions and disorders to look at. Um, so keep in mind as we talk about this that um, an impairment and an in and itself is not a disability. The impairment must substantially limit one major life activity or more in order to be considered a disability under Section 504. Um, some examples in addition to the ones you see here are contagious and non-contagious diseases and conditions hearing impairments, cerebral palsy, epilepsy, which I know um, that's one of our focuses here tonight, muscular dystrophy, multiple sclerosis, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, HIV, tuberculosis, and I could go on. Um, and so there is a second part of this, the or. So let's talk about that. So any mental or physio physiological disorder, such as an intellectual disability, an organic brain syndrome. So remembering that these are things we might not be able to see. That's why we need to really analyze them uh, before we make determinations. An emotional or mental illness or a specific learning disability. An interesting note is the term disability um, does not include um, transsexualism, pedophilia, exhibitionism, voyeurism, gender identity disorders not resulting from physical impairments or other sexual behavior disorders. Um, it also does not include gambling, kleptomania, or pyromania. Just some things to think about um, as we go through this. What are some other possible impairments? This list is not exhaustive, so just keep that in mind. Um, these are just some examples, and I'm not gonna read all of those to you, but again, um, I know a lot of our kiddos have arthritis. Um, so they might have a, a 504 plan if they meet that two prong criteria that it affects one major life activity. Um, and you do see there that epilepsy is on this list. Again, not an exhaustive list, uh, but just some um, 
areas impairments for you to think about. So what are some non-examples of impairments? Compulsive gambling, uh, voyeurism, gender identity disorders. I bring that one up because that we often talk about right now uh, in schools. And so let me further emphasize what, um, why that would be a non-example or how it could be an example. So let's say a student who has a gender identity disorder, they would not be automatically obligated to receive a 504, um, Section 504 plan agreement. However, if that student would have depression related to their gender identity disorder, then it might be looked at as substantially limiting one major life activity or one major life function and therefore, that student under further analysis could receive a Section 504 plan. So again, these impairments alone uh, might not um, um, have the student having a 504 plan. However, if they have depression or something else that goes along with it, it might uh, result in um, having a 504 plan. Again, it is all on a case-by-case -case basis. So now let's talk about what we mean about substantially limits. And again, this is one of those terms um, that uh, sometimes is really not defined for us. And again, that's why the team um, with at the school, including the parent, really needs to look at this. So we've gone over physical or mental impairment, uh, but remember the student has to meet all three prongs in order to be considered for a 504 service agreement um, and a free appropriate public education. Um, it's important to remember because we have to have all of those um, in order for the child to uh, receive a plan. So the key word here is substantially. Um, the impairment simply needs to be a substantial limitation rather than a significant or severe restriction. Um, and so to gauge substantial, a student is to be measured compared with their average peers in the general population not against his or her own potential. Um, an impairment or an illness itself is not a disability. The impairment or disability must substantially limit one or more major life activity. And that comes right from the Office of Civil Rights. So again, we're going to talk about that a little bit more um, and making sure that um, we note that the US Department of Education did not define substantially for us. This is really something that the local education agency, the LEA, um, should make its determination of, of what substantially limits means. Um, and again, that's why we use a, a team effort to look at this. So what do we mean by substantially limits? The determination of substantial, as you see here, must be made without regard to the ameliorating effects of any mitigating measures the student is using. And this is a change from the prior law, um, as we talked about earlier. When determining if a student um, has a mental or physical impairment that substantially limits a major life activity, you may not, the team may not consider mitigating measures with the exception, of course, of ordinary uh, eyeglasses or contact lenses. So mitigating measures, what are they? Um, they're devices or practices that a person uses to correct or reduce the effects of the impairment, such as equipment or medications. Um, and so that this is new. Um, so that means that you must consider whether or not there is a substantial limitation without the consideration of any corrective device or medication. Again, this is a change in the law from what we knew prior. So some examples of mitigating measures, um, as you see here, are medication, um, a prosthetic, um, oxygen therapy, um, a hearing aid or a cochlear implant, a low vision device, um, a medical supply, and, and you see mobility devices. And again, the non-example again, as, as I mentioned, is glasses or, or contacts. Um, so mitigating measures are really a, a better way of looking at that are things that we refer to that the student comes to school with. In other words, these are things that were probably provided to the child from the parent, including things via their insurance or medical doctors. Um, so for example, a good one is if a child needs an inhaler, that is something that the school provides. Um, so 
Um, the ADAA clarifies that the determination of whether an impairment substantially limits a major life activity must be made without uh, regard to this effect of mitigating measures, such as the medication and all those other things listed on the screen there. Um, and so really, uh, LEA school districts must make their own Section 504 determinations based upon the child's disability as it presents itself without those mitigating measures. So um, that's really helpful um, to think about. So how is uh, substantially, sorry, substantially limiting uh, determined? Um, it is a case by case determination. And again, uh, I can't reiterate this enough that the law does not define substantially limit. Um, it, it really leaves it to um, the local education agency to make that determination. Um, there is an evaluation process. Um, and again, that impairment need only substantially limit a single major life activity to be considered a disability. Um, and again, um, I can't reiterate this enough either that it cannot consider if mitigating measures are available to lessen the impact of impairment. Um, and it does not mean severely restricts. Um, so for example, um, um, in order to reiterate substantially limits, um, there was an example given by an attorney in an article about Section 504, where a student could walk for 10 miles continuously um, is not substantially limiting in walking because on the 11th mile, the child starts to feel discomfort, okay? Um, and the law does require that a group of knowledgeable persons uh, draw upon information from a variety of resources. And we're gonna talk about this a little bit more. Um, and this, this means that you would have as part of the group people that know this student and are familiar and can provide uh, information from assessments um, to make the determination about a Section 504 or Chapter 15 service agreement plan. Some non-examples of substantially limits. Um, so many students do have a physical or mental impairment, uh, but again, if it does not substantially limit a major life activity, the student is not eligible. And you see there are those two boxes. So if I have mild depression, um, that does not affect my student, my attendance or my behavior or grades. Um, I, I probably would not have, um, you know, need a, a 504 plan. Um, or if I have a mild allergy to eggs that causes a mild rash, um, I probably would not need a 504 plan for that. Um, so just, those are just two examples. Again, not totally exhaustive. Um, and and the, the thing to remember here is, um, it needs to substantially limit one major life activity. So again, you've heard me say this buzzword, let's talk about major life activity. Um, so we've just gone over physical or mental impairment, substantially limits, uh, but remember the student has to meet all three. Um, so let's go over what major life activity means. So a person is considered an individual with a disability when one or more um, of the individual's major life activities are restricted as to the conditions, manner, or duration under which they can be performed in comparison to most people. And for our students, we mean against their peers. Um, this is a change from the prior law. Um, previously, a disability had to affect uh, more than one major life activity, and now it's changed to just be one uh, or more. Um, so it only needs to affect one. So let's look at some major life activity examples. Um, hearing, learning, sleeping, walking, thinking. Um, you know, a lot of folks get hung up on a lot of these because you can't actually see them. Um, that is why we say that assessments and folks that know the student uh, are so very important to making this determination. Um, functions of the immune system neurological functions, just things that we might not be able to see um, or, or have tangible evidence. So we really need to make sure when we are looking at these, the one major life activity that it impacts, um, that we have data to back that up. Um, again, these are not, this is not an exhaustive list. Um, so please keep that in mind. So just some um, information about some special cases. So 
there is something called temporary impairments. And basically what that means is that it, um, it does not constitute a disability for purposes of Section 504 unless its severity is such that results in a substantial limitation of one or more major life activity for an extended period of time. Um, and it must be resolved in a case-by-case -case basis um, and taken into consideration. Um, and then episodic impairments um, would be if the dis disability substantially limits a major life activity when active. So you have students that um, would have seasonal allergies, that would be maybe an episodic impairment. So they need a plan uh, when uh, the seasonal allergies are most rampant uh, and when they're not, they might not need a plan. Um, and going back to temporary impairments, I don't know if I said this, but um, typically temporary meaning six months or less. So I'm a student that's receiving uh, chemotherapy, let's say, and um, now I'm in remission and um, I still might have the impairment, but right now it's not active, if you will, so I might not need a plan at that time. Um, and then the last one there, impairments in remission, and again, this could go for cancer, epilepsy, multiple sclerosis. So things um, that when um, it was substantially limiting when it was active, and now that it's not active, it's not substantially limiting. But remembering that, um, you know, the team could come back together and say that it's, it's not in remission anymore and that the child needs a plan um, to help them out um, during the day um, when it is active. Um, so another um, example of that, just to note, is that if a student has a seizure disorder and receives services to help him or her participate in school when the seizures were active, um, they would still be eligible for applicable services, even if it's gone a prolonged period of time without having a seizure, um, because when they did have seizures, they qualified or it affected one major life activity. So again, it is on a case-by-case -case basis uh, to make that determination. Um, of what the child needs. So here are just some examples under Section 504 um, of, of what um, it might look like. So if a student breaks their arm in five places and cannot write, um, an example of what the LEA might be providing to the student is someone taking notes or writing their homework. Um, the third one down there, student has cancer, diabetes, epilepsy, allergies, or asthma. Um, the student is allowed to obtain treatment or medication as needed, so it might uh, coincide with the student's health plan with the nurse in the school. Um, sometimes we see that the 504 plan and the health plan um, are integrated together, so something to think about. Um, the student uses a wheelchair. They're permitted to leave class early to avoid hall traffic. Um, again, um, and the last one, their student is under a doctor's care for depression or anxiety. Um, or have ADHD and they're given additional time for completing assignments or allowed to sit in the front of the classroom. Again, a, not exhaustive at all. Um, these are just some examples to get you thinking about what plans could be in place for certain um, areas that do impact one major life activity. Okay, thank you, Ronnie, for setting the stage. Um, <clears throat> our next component that we're going to uh, be talking about. And I'm going to try to um, walk and chew gum at the same time. So I'm going to try to um, continue with the slide deck <laughs> um, as is and um, uh, give my presentation. So again, if you have questions as we're going through, because we're, now we're going to be get, getting into the nitty gritty of what goes into developing a service agreement, who's at the table, and what components are required. Um, so that's in our next section here. So um, why is Section 504 important in schools? S Section 504 is important for schools because it protects students who are not eligible under IDEA to receive services. FAPE, as Ronnie had mentioned, or Free Appropriate Public Education, is defined as the provision of regular or special education and related services that are designed to meet the individual educational needs of a disabled student as adequately as the needs of a non-disabled student are met. Everything on this slide relates to the protections under Section 504. However, everything on the slide is not specifically written into a 504 service agreement. 
Specifically, although students are protected from discrimination in extracurricular and non-academic activities under Section 504, the specific accommodations needed would not specifically be written into a 504 service agreement necessarily. But let's look into this a little bit further and talk a little bit more specifically about what needs to be included in a Section 504 service agreement. So the definition of a service agreement, in the state of Pennsylvania, written service agreements are required for students to receive services under Section 504, Chapter 15. So again, the key, and this should be underlined, the key word here is a written service agreement is what is um, allowed in Pennsylvania. <clears throat> 504 service agreements are legal documents. As with IEPs, 504 service agreements must receive all the services documented. All personnel involved with the student should receive a copy of the service agreement. And if the service agreement is not followed, a complaint can be filed with the PA Bureau of Special Education or the Federal Office of Civil Rights, um, which Ronnie explained up front. Sorry, I didn't, I don't think I flipped that slide, did I? <laughs> okay. Um, so on this next slide, we have, um, these are examples of aids, services, and accommodations. Again, this is not as an exhaustive list. Um, we did provide you some resources um, at the end of the presentation. The last slide also has, our, the um, next to the last slide has a list of resources um, with the references. <clears throat> Although these are the required components of a 504 service agreement. Although the required components of a 504 service agreement are not prescribed by law, best practice suggests a plan should address the educational impact of the identified dis disability and the services and accommodations necessary to facilitate equal access to education in the least restrictive environment. One of the handouts that was provided as part of this session is um, it, it's identified as PA's recommended sample 504 service agreement. It's the implementation of chapter 15 packet. The handout um, contains several key items and they are as follows. Um, number one, which um, Ronnie uh, mentioned this at the beginning of the, the session is the PA code implementation of chapter 15. Um, that's one of the hand, that's part of the handout packet. Uh, number two is the sample district initiated evaluation. Number three is a sample notice to parents. Number four are sample procedural safeguards notice. And number five is a sample service agreement. Again, that is all in that one packet um, that was provided uh, to you for this session. The Section 504 service agreement should indicate what services will be provided, how, when, where, and who will be responsible for mon monitoring implementation of the Section 504 service plan. Additional recommendations of 504 plans. These are additional recommendations. Um, number one, it is to assure information is available from the family um, and that fam the parents should be invited and encouraged to assist in the development of the 504 service agreement. Services and accommodations should be based on data used in the evaluation and determination of the disability. Number three, services and accommodations should address the student's identified disability and ensure educational needs are met as adequately as possible to non-disabled peers. And number four, the plan should in may include, does not necessarily need to, but may include a self-management of health conditions if needed. 
So what are some LEA responsibilities or local education uh, responsibilities and information regarding um, their processes? So your school districts are um, to conduct appropriate child find and initiate in initial evaluations. They are to establish standards and procedures for identification and, and evaluation, conduct periodic re-evaluations of students with disabilities, provide FAPE through the provision of Section 504 plan to meet the individual educational needs of eligible students as adequately as the needs of non-disabled students are met. FAPE, again, consists of the provision of regular special ed and related services and is designed to meet the student's individual educational needs as adequately as the needs of non-disabled peers. Note, this is not the same definition of FAPE that is written into IDEA. So um, again, Ronnie um, covered this up front, but IDEA, or I'm sorry, FAPE under IDEA is a little bit different than FAPE um, within the context of 504 service agreements. Um, LEAs are also responsible for providing education to students with disabilities in the least restrictive environment. Again, that's uh, a PDE commitment um, to all students. Provide students with disabilities equal access to non-academic or extracurricular services. Establish and implement a system of procedural safeguards regarding the identification, evaluation, placement, or provision of FAPE to a student and ensure behavior in question is not a manifestation of a student's disability during disciplinary proceedings. <clears throat> Some more LEA responsibilities. Um, again, LEAs have the responsibility to designate one individual to oversee the 504 process to ensure that compliance and consistency um, throughout the district. Um, PD requires LEAs to undertake child find activities to identify students with, with a disability. And you can find out about your local education um, agency's child find uh, notice and policy is always posted on their website and is available annually uh, with an annual child find notice. A PD requires LEAs to inform parents of enrolled students that the LEA does not discriminate against protected handicapped students. 504 is a general education responsibility and regulation. Again, it falls under the federal uh, 504 uh, ADA Act. There is a difference between, um, um, but schools can assign the responsibility of oversight to any personnel. Um, and sometimes it does land in the lap of special education, but just to be clear, it is a general education responsibility. So even if it's not the building principal, that provides that oversight and um, it falls under the roles and responsibilities of the special education director, which sometimes happens in schools. Um, it's still, again, a general education responsibility and oversight. Um, again, however, child fine must still occur. There is a difference between child fine for IDEA and 504. Under IDEA, the LEA could be either the IU or the district or school depending on the circumstances. For 504, the LEA responsible for the child is always the district or school. <clears throat> LEA responsibilities continued. There is no statute of limitations for liability, but case law has defined it as two years, and this coincides with IDEA. Um, there was a case in the Third Circuit, Pennsylvania falls in under the jurisdiction of the Third Circuit courts that stated a two-year statute of limitations as the guiding timeline uh, for, uh, for 504 service agreements. Um, if a child with a 504 service agreement misbehaves and the behavior was not a manifestation of the disability, the child can be expelled from school permanently this is not the case with IDEA. Um, chapter 12 allows 30 days for parents to find a placement for the child if the child is expelled due to behavior that is not a manifestation. The child um, is to receive services until age 17. In addition, there is no interim alternative educational uh, 
provision in 504. That doesn't mean that that's not a, an option with the LEA. <clears throat> LEA responsibilities continue to, a student is not entitled to a Section 504 Chapter 15 service agreement for services, accommodations, or modifications if parents revoke consent for special education programs and services. Um, Again, under IDA, a parent right, may revoke consent in writing for his or her child's receipt of special education services after the parent's child was initially provided special education and related services. Um, so in other words, a school does, or an LEA does not automatically have to provide a 504 service agreement to a student whose parents revoked special education. It should be evaluated on a case by case basis. So it does, if, if a child is identified as a child with a disability in need of specially designed instruction, um, and the parents uh, agree to services, but later revoke those privileges, it does not necessarily entitle your child to receive um, a 504 service agreement. It's not like a consolation prize, so to speak. Okay, timelines continued. Here we go. <clears throat> Five or four um, timelines are not clearly specified in law, but they must be reasonable. Although there is no regulatory requirements under 504 service agreements, a school district may choose to follow the IDA timelines, which the courts have deemed as reasonable. Um, again, here, you know, the, the, these processes are listed here under IDEA, identification, evaluation, IEP service agreement, and procedural safeguards. Section 504 and IDEA are silent regarding parental consent for an evaluation. However, the Office of Civil Rights requires written cons consent best practice would be to follow the evaluation timelines and procedures for identification and referral of a student under IDA. The procedural safeguards related to 504 are much slimmer than those required of IDA. Um, you in the sample packet that I mentioned up front um, that had a, a sample procedural safeguards notice. So that would be what the, the procedural safeguards um, look like in regard to 504 service agreements. The written notice and procedural safeguards are not sub separate documents to be sent according to Chapter 15. So for evaluation, LEAs must establish standards and protocols um, for initial evaluations and placement. LEAs must establish procedures for re-evaluations. Re Again, the recommendations or reasonable timelines uh, procedures would be an explanation of how you are going to do it. Um, tests are selected and administered to best ensure results accurately reflect the student's aptitude or achievement or other factor being measured. Evaluations must evaluate the specific areas of educational need, not just IQ, and be administered by trained personnel. <coughs> Excuse me. Standards and procedures are considered to be sufficient if they are reasonably calculated. Again, going back to um, using, implementing the use of the um, IDA timelines is, is considered to be reasonable. The parent now, as far as evaluation, uh, again, this is continued from the last slide. The parent is not a required member of the team making the determination. However, the group must consider information from the parent. Um, a medical di diagnosis may not suffice as an evaluation for the purpose of providing FAPE. A physician's medical diagnosis may be considered among other sources in evaluating a student. A medical diagnosis of an illness, 
does not automatically mean a student is eligible to receive 504 services. Again, I want to, you know, take you back to the table uh, Ronnie introduced you to at the beginning of the session. Um, that's kind of like uh, a good matrix to follow if you're looking at, you know, what um, are the criteria and uh, as well as those three prongs that we went over. Um, the illness, again, must cause a substantial limitation on a major like life activity. So there's your three prongs. It's a disability. Um, the illness is causing a substantial limitation to one, at least one single major life activity. There is no provision of an independent evaluation in Section 504. However, the results of an independent evaluation may be one of the sources to consider. So if you go and get an independent evaluation done, um, you can bring it into the uh, school um, as, as another source of information for the team to consider. On the other hand, if the school requires a medical diagnosis as part of the data, then the school must pay for it unless the parents have already had the related medical tests. The school may ask the parent to provide additional medical records, which the parents um, may have and to grant the district permission to evaluate uh, the student. There is no regulation that any particular source of data carry any more weight um, than anything else. The weight of the information is determined by the group depending on the child's individual circumstances and the needs within the school setting. Variety of sources, again, is not defined. However, you would want to consider things like information from the parents, teachers, test data, medical data, behavioral data, et cetera. The school's uh, procedures should, again, spell out the process uh, and how they will conduct the Chapter 15 evaluation. Just as with IDA, if a parent disagrees with the determination, he or she may request a due process hearing. <clears throat> These are some examples of evaluative uh, sources, but the, again, this is not an exhaustive list. Nothing that we show you is going to be exhaustive because we have pages and pages of um, content in regard to uh, Section 504 service agreements and different resources that can provide you with, uh, you know, ad nauseum lists. So um, certainly those are that's something to consider if you uh, want to dig more deeply into more exhaustive lists our sources. So again, you can see here parental input. Um, again, the team, the group is required to um, gather data from parents, medical data that's available, um, you know, adaptive behaviors, achievement data, and any other data that would be considered a factor um, in, in supporting the students' needs within the school setting. Reevaluation. And, and this is an important note. If the parent refuses to produce the child for reevaluation, re the school must initiate due process. Um, this is different from IDEA. Consent is not required for reevaluation, it is only required for initial evaluation and existing. And I'm sorry, exiting. So again, there is no timeline um, that's dictated, but um, the three-year interval, as you can see in the red um, font, three-year interval is recommended um, or considered reasonable. That is just like I IDEA, um, unless the parent and school agree it's unnecessary. Um, it can be conducted more frequently if conditions warrant. Um, it may not occur more than once per year unless parents and school agree otherwise. Okay, and as promised, this is, um, you know, your list of references that we um, put together in regard to the resources that we use to create the presentation tonight. Um, these, again, are going to get, provide you with more exhaustive lists. Um, I think it's the U.S. Department of Ed uh, 504 Guidelines for Administrators. Um, there's, uh, is it Section E? I believe, general strategies. Um, there's one of these documents that actually has 
Um, the charts are in there, but we also gave you the charts as handouts. Um, one of the documents here listed, and I, I believe it is the Department of Ed uh, document, actually has a list of disability categories with potential um, uh, accommodations. And I, I think it's a nice list because it does, you know, list things like specific things like asthma, diabetes, epilepsy. So you can go in there and see um, what are some potential accommodations. And also if you're kind of hitting a wall that, you know, the team is hitting a wall in regard to, um, you, know, you know, meeting the needs of, of a student, that might be something to kind of pull out and, and see what are some other accommodations that could potentially help that student. So, and if there are no questions, and I don't, I didn't see any in the chat when you were presenting, Ronnie, I don't know if there's any in the chat now, um, but we can take questions now, um, but this is our contact information should you have specific questions. Emails typically, you know, the go-to <laughs> for us um, because we not, we're not necessarily in the office all the time, so. Any questions? Yeah, and please just unmute um, or turn your video on or whatever you want to do if you have a question. You don't have to put it in the chat. Yeah, I should have said that. I didn't even think they could unmute themselves. <laughs> yeah, they can. Gretchen, is there anything that you've maybe talked to this group about that maybe we missed or, or would help um, further focus in on, on your needs? Hold on a second. Okay. okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, no, you know, I think that you covered a lot on there, um, you know, which, you know, a lot of times I think, um, you know, people that we've worked with in the past, you know, they're not all that familiar with Section 504, um, you know, as opposed to the, the IEP, they figure if they can't, you know, if they don't qualify for the IDEA, a lot of times they don't realize that, you know, there is another service that they can, can take advantage of. So I think that you all covered that very well. Right. Um, yeah, um, I, I think that's a good point. Um, oftentimes, you know, there might be, um, just something that is impacting the student's life um, right now, and maybe it didn't before, but now it is, um, and they might just need a plan that way. And again, oftentimes, like I said, um, I know we don't do training on the health plans that students have with nurses in schools, um, but sometimes that is uh, put together. Um, and it really is helpful um, if you feel that a plan is needed um, so that, um, um, all of the teachers involved with the student are aware of what accommodations or um, what's been put in place. And, and oftentimes that's, that's what we find. And we didn't include that in this um, just because this presentation was not for school districts. But when we talk to school districts, we emphasize to them, you know, the reason that the Office of Civil Rights oftentimes visits them is because, not because they don't have a plan, but because it's not been implemented. Um, so the one thing we emphasize to them is making sure that you know who's putting the plans together, who's overseeing the plans, who's doing walkthroughs to make sure that the plans are actually being implemented for our students. Um, so those are some things that, that we share with them so they don't forget. Um, and we often have found also that, um, and Nicole might have mentioned this, I believe, um, we're seeing a lot more where school counselors are being given this job to do in schools. So if you as a parent or caregiver here on the call um, don't, aren't sure who to go to, it might be your school counselor. Um, and I'd like to say a big thank you to Ronnie and Nicole for that very informative presentation. We really appreciate it. Um, I'd also like to once again thank our, uh, our sponsors for this series, uh, Greenwich Biosciences, Levanova, Zogenics, Norellis, Aquestive Therapeutics, and UCB. Um, thank you all so much for taking time out of your evening to uh, join us for this webinar. It's been great um, having you, and I hope that you all stay safe and healthy. Thank you.